What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast interview. First off, thank you so much for tuning in, for checking out the show. Um, your support is massively, massively appreciated. The only reason that this show exists is because of all of your amazing support. So we truly appreciate your support. I truly appreciate your support. Make sure that you're sharing the show with as many people that you feel would benefit from the show. The goal is to always grow this show and go out there and have a big impact. Real quick though, before we jump into today's podcast, I want to plug our sponsors that make all of this possible. Our first sponsor is my personal 90-day mastery boot camp. This is my real estate agent mentorship training program. Um, It's a group training platform. This way it makes it extremely affordable for you. Inside this program, however, um, I am unpacking my entire playbook. I'm walking you through step by step everything that I do inside my real estate business, everything that I've done, everything I've learned um, in my 12 plus year career with selling over 5,000 homes, with selling over a billion dollars in real estate. Um, and I walk you through step by step exactly what I've done, how I built what I've built, um, and what I'm doing today to go out there and create the success. But don't mistake the low cost. Um, for low value. This is an insanely in-depth, step-by-step program um, where I'm walking you through, again, step-by-step on how I go out there. My team sells one to two homes every single day in today's market, continue to grow my business year after year, and how I've been able to exit from selling, exit from actually day-to-day involvement in my real estate team and create an epic, amazing real estate team that not only sustains but grows without my involvement. So whatever level that you're at, whether you're a brand new real estate agent, Agent, you're an a individual high producing agent that wants to expand and create a team, or if you already have an amazing team or your broker owner that's looking to step up your internal training, looking to step up your systems, your processes, your tracking, make your business more predictable, this program is absolutely for anybody that's serious about leveling up inside their business. So check us out, www.90daymastery.com. Uh, make sure you use promo code Live Mastery, all one word, all together, all caps. That's going to get you the biggest discount on 90mastery.com. You're going to see tons of testimonials on their video testimonials, what's included in the program, the future dates of the program. I do several of these every single year, so make sure to check us out and make sure to jump inside that program ASAP. Uh, my next uh, uh, next sponsor that makes this uh, uh, show possible is PerfectStormNow.com. If you're a real estate agent and you are looking for a lead generation machine website, backed by an insanely powerful CRM system that allows you to convert your leads to appointments at the highest possible level, manage all your tasks, make sure that you're effective and efficient as you possibly can be inside your business, transaction management component, all of that stuff. It is hands down by far the most effective and affordable real estate website and CRM program that exists out there in the industry. It's what I use to go out there and sell 650 plus homes every single year and the system is gnarly. If you're signing up for that program, Make sure to use promo code MASTERYPSN, all caps, all one word, all together. That'll save you the $200 registration fee and get you a great discount. Um, Our last sponsor is REO University. So I teamed up with a good buddy of mine who is the most knowledgeable dude, hands down, that I've ever met when it comes to REO properties. This guy used to work for the the banks directly as an asset manager, um, and uh, he developed so many of the systems that you see that asset managers and asset management firms and banks use today. Um, This guy sold over 11,000 properties, foreclosure properties as an asset manager. And he and I teamed up um, with my experience of of working with over 35 banks in my career, selling thousands of REOs plus his experience. We've created uh, uh, just an insane program. Again, um, REO University, the website is www.reo.com. R-E-O Mastery University. Um, it's a one-time payment for $9.97 or you can split that up into three monthly payments. Uh, this is not a live boot camp like my 90 Mastery Boot Camp. This is something that you have access to instantaneously. We we'll walk you through exactly how to go out there and get in with the banks. Um, so how to get the business, but then how to service that business at the highest level. Um, how to go out there and complete BPOs. How to complete cash for keys. How to, how to make sure that you're insane at your valuations. How to go out there and, and uh, make sure that you're your asset managers are winning and hitting their goals
goals, key indicators you need to look for, and more. There's 22 in-depth, um, just amazing, powerful modules that will teach you how to become an REO machine inside your real estate business. Now, if you're like me, I don't want my business to ever be in a vulnerable position, right? I don't care if it's a good market, bad market. It doesn't mean that my business needs to be good or bad. My business can always be great during a market crash, right? There's no such thing as if the market's going to crash. It's just a matter of when, right? But again, you don't need to put yourself in a vulnerable position. You can make sure that your real estate business is 100% recession proof um, and go out there and of course, generate business, do a ton of business regardless of what's happening in the marketplace. And this is exactly how you go out there and do it. And we walk you through step by step. So check us out, reomasteryuniversity.com. You can learn more about the program, hopefully register for the program, jump on in. Um, This price will not last long, right? We just created this product, rolled it out uh, uh, several months ago, and uh, just getting in the hands of the consumer, and people are having a lot of amazing success. So again, check us out, reomasteryuniversity.com. All right, again, you guys, thank you so much for watching this show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure to share the show. Make sure to comment, uh, um, um, you know, like us on YouTube, leave some positive comments. We love hearing back from you guys um, and love getting your feedback. Keep kicking ass, and let's jump on in to today's interview. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast where every single week we interview top real estate agents, top entrepreneurs, and just straight up top badasses that they're choosing to dominate their space. They're people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves, for their families, as well as have a big impact on others. And today, you guys, we've got another special, amazing guest on the show. And this is a guy that uh, had a lot of success in the corporate world, but some things came up in his life. He, he made the the decision to take a shift, make a shift, um, seek entrepreneurship, take that risk, uh, become a real estate agent, and now he's just killing, right? Not only a very successful real estate agent, one of the top in in his area, as well as uh, uh, a broker owner and doing some really, really big things there. So really stoked and honored to have Steve Wild on the show. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you for having me, Josh. Yeah, no, I'm excited, man. So I, I was, uh, you know, reading up on you before uh, before we got in this interview, and you've got some really, really cool YouTube video- videos that um, are different, you know, right? Uh, uh, different in a good way that separates you, and you know, I think gets the audience to or those that are uh, just to connect with you on a deeper level. And and um, you know, one of the things, you know, because you were you had a very successful corporate, you know, the corporate gig going on before this, you know, and, and a lot of people get stuck on that path. It may not be the journey that they really love. It may not be their true passion, but it's like, look, we got commitments, we got families, we kind of get stuck going down this path. Um, and so things happen. And I know in the video you talked about things during 9-11 um, that happened. I'm just curious, man, like what, what, what was that ultimate defining moment that made you decide to get into real estate, to leave that great job, get into real estate, and why real estate? Uh, well, great question. So I was uh, a corporate attorney uh, back in the late 90s um, and early 2000s. And uh, at the time, uh, well, I should back up and say, I went to law school, not so much as I had a burning desire to be a lawyer my whole life, but more as a placeholder, because uh, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life. And I thought having a legal background would be a good asset, regardless of what direction I went in, into. And so I practiced law for seven years, the last five years of which I was with America Online. And if you can remember back then, we were, AOL was a super exciting, growing, and frankly, the dominant player in, the, in that uh, internet media space. Um, I was there uh, during and after the Time Warner merger. Um, actually, my, my last year at AOL, my last two years, um, I met and got married to uh, my wife, who was also working there. Um, I was uh, very fortunate to be asked to move to London to help build out the AOL Europe uh, space, which is for AOL Time Warner was a huge growth opportunity. So uh, um, shortly after I got married, I basically had AOL pay for an extended honeymoon while my wife and I lived in London, in a beautiful apartment and on an expat package, very exciting stuff we were doing over there. Um, and uh, while we were living in London, uh, 9-11 happened. And uh, like most people that sort of, you know, made me uh, look at priorities. Um, uh, and 
Um, we moved, my wife and I moved back to the States after the secondment ended, and I went back to working for AOL headquarters here in the DC area. And my, I've always had an entrepreneur itch. Um, and so uh, I would say that, you know, I also saw the deal, the, the path I was on at AOL was what I call the deal path, which was, I was in this engine, this, this, uh, this engine where you would get, you would do a deal and, and a corporate deal, uh, at least the kind of deals I was doing would have a, a, a life of anywhere from two to three weeks, um, sometimes to several months. And when you got sucked into a deal, it was like getting sucked into a black hole and getting spit out the other side. So um, I just knew that was just not the lifestyle I wanted long term. Um, and I was looking for other entrepreneurial op opportunities. Now, being a, a trained lawyer, uh, I'm very good at seeing problems. I'm, you know, lawyers are trained to see the glass half empty. And so uh, I'm, I can pick apart any idea and find the holes in it. And so uh, that makes, it frankly made me more risk averse. And my brother is the one who first uh, opened my eyes to the possibility of my becoming a real estate agent. Um, and because he got his license uh, a year or two before I did. And my brother went to Yale uh, University, got his uh, uh, Bachelor of Arts from Yale and has a Harvard MBA. And this is around 2000, 2001. And at the time, for someone with that pedigree to go into real estate uh, residential sales, that was unheard of. And like most people, um, or I shouldn't say like most people, I thought he was making a crazy decision. And I did what any good little brother would do at the time. And I, I made fun of him mercilessly for uh, about a year. But the whole time I was sort of, it made me actually even consider the possibility of my doing it. And after a year of thinking about it, and so 9-11 happened, um, I moved back from London, which is this very exciting place, to, to AOL headquarters, which is a place I was already, had always been. So in a way, it was, you know, even though I was, had more responsibility and was growing my, my, field, my uh, field of people that I was managing, it felt like a step back in a way. And, I, and, I, and uh, um, uh, the last thing I'd say is I had a little bit of savings from my AOL days that I had a, uh, enough of a cushion that I felt like I could take a – uh, a leap. So I decided, uh, I decided to do it. And um, I felt that my skill set um, was uh, really well, uh, well, uh, um, could help people in this in this new role, uh, you know, in the, in the deal path and going, you know, getting a little pulling the heartstrings a little bit, it wasn't very rewarding. Uh, you know, I, it was, it was sort of intellectual um, re reward from doing tough, complicated deals. But at the end of it, it was just sort of, you know, just another deal for a corporation. Um, I, I knew that in the, in the residential side of things there, um, like I said, in the video that I think you saw this morning, you, know, you, you get thank yous and hugs and, and it's just a, just a much more rewarding uh, experience. The ability to impact people's lives at a much more, uh, basic level is is in this business, and uh, with that uh, paradigm, I decided to make the plunge in 2002. Yeah, love it. Yeah, because it was, uh, you know, as you were telling that story, I'm still thinking, well, you know, you, 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 if you wanted to go out there and, you know, you, you had that entrepreneur spirit that you were already had inside you, you could start your own law practice or, or whatever. But, you know, as you said, that makes sense, right? Um, you know, because, yeah, you want to create that financial success, but if you're missing that fulfillment component, right, um, you know, it doesn't matter how much money you make, it, it just doesn't always do it for you. So, so I love that, man. So, all right, so then you jump in, you decide to get licensed. Now, we're in an industry where you got 90% that fail in, in the first three years. And, you know, it doesn't, I mean, I've seen people from all different backgrounds. You know, really, it just seems like those that, those that make it, and not just real estate, but a lot of entrepreneurial ventures are just those that are truly committed, that really want it, that have that discipline. And what did you do out of the gate when you first started to ensure that you weren't one of those statistics and then, you know, having to go back into corporate law? Uh, great question. So, you know, as you mentioned earlier, I'm, all, I'm a principal broker now, so I also talk to a lot of new agents and I, and I, I share that statistic that you said about the 90% failure rate. Um, and I and I do talk about my journey, what I did, um, and I you know, I can attribute uh, um, my early success to my brother's advice, which was, uh, you know, 
cultivating your business when you're when you're new is hard work. Um, and I when I started, I came into this business with the I, with the mindset that that failure was not an option. Um, so before I left AOL, I I walked through every I knocked on every door of everyone I knew there, and I let people know what I was doing. And I had a nice long chat with people, and I told them. Um, and what's funny about you know it may, this might be unique to the, the legal profession, but lawyer most lawyers want to get out of the profession, but they're too afraid to do it. Yeah. So whenever they hear of one of their colleagues leaving, they're sort of like this. Uh, uh, vicarious uh, excitement for them. It's like, can you make, can someone, you know, leave and, and be successful? So I had a lot of support on that front. But basically, I let everyone know what I was going to do, what I was going to do, and I let them know, I let them know that once I was licensed and set up with the brokerage, I'd be reaching out to them again, and could I have their permission to do so? And then, so what I did was, I, I started. Uh, I started the process of letting them know what, what I was doing, and I, I made a small promise to them that I would be reaching out to them. And then, when I got my license, um, I did send out what I on a, our corporate letterhead a very well, you know, at least I like to think it was a well written letter introducing myself in my new capacity. And I signed the letter, and I wrote. I signed my name, and then I wrote a little handwritten note at the bottom of the letter saying, hey, John, it was great chatting with you two weeks ago. I did it. I got my license. I'll be calling you in a couple weeks. Um, and even though, even though they're, if they're not going to read the letter, they're definitely – no one doesn't read a handwritten note. So I knew at a minimum they were going to read that. And, again, I made a small promise to them in the letter that I was going to be reaching out to them. And like clockwork – Two weeks later, I would call John and say, hey, John, did, did you get my letter? I just wanted to follow up and let you know I'm, I'm in this capacity. I have access to incredible resources. And if you ever know of anyone who needs my you know, real estate uh, assistance on the real estate front, please let me know. I'd love, I'd love to help uh, any of your friends or, or family or colleagues. Um, and of course, you know, uh, of course, I'd, in part of that process, I would be qualifying them and asking them if they already have a relationship with the realtor. And then after that, um, uh, at, oh, at the end of that phone call, I'd also say, hey, John, do you mind if I keep in touch with you from time to time? Great. Thank you. And hang up. And immediately when I hang up the phone, I'd write a thank you note. So now I've, I've, I've had an introductory meeting. I sent an official letter, had another conversation, and then sent a thank you note. So four touches in about a two-month period. And John, the, you know, John would know I'm, I'm dead serious. And then three months later, I would contact John again. So it's, it's not rocket science, but it's, it's disciplined. And, you know, I, trust me, just like everyone else, there are a lot of people on that call list. So I wasn't 100% comfortable calling, but I had a no skip rule. And I just, if they're on the list, I called or wrote them. And in my first year in business with absolutely uh, no structure templates, uh, uh, you know, building it from scratch, I did about 8 million in volume. Wow. That's insane. That's awesome, man. Yeah. You know, I, I meet so many new real estate agents and whether it's through the podcast or just being in the industry, like you are, like you said, you, you talk to so many, you know, new, new agents and, you know, people that jump in this business are like, Oh, I'm brand new. I don't, I don't have a database yet. And it's like, well, what about your last job, your last careers? Go through your yearbooks. Go through, you know, um, did you keep that specific to just AOL or did you do that with, hey, man, everybody I went to college with, everybody that I, you know, family members, whatever it may be. I mean, did you, did you just follow that strategy with your whole entire sphere of influence? I went through my, I, exactly right. I went through my whole sphere of influence. I went through college friends, law school friends, uh, People I um, play squash with, and it turns out, you know, you know that's sort of one of my passions is squash. I I've sold so many houses to my squash uh, buddies. Um, it's it's been great, and it's you know it doesn't feel like work when you're you know you're doing something that you're passionate about. Yep, love it. So then, all right. So you 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 do that, and like you said, it wasn't rocket science, but you got to get out of your comfort zone. It wasn't comfortable as you talked about. It, it, it's discipline. It's consistency. You're you're staying on it. You're staying organized. You do eight million your first year, which is almost unheard of, right? You, you know, you know. You, you, I I think the statistic out there, and you might know better than me, but your average first year realtor does ten thousand in commissions, right? So, um, um, pretty amazing. But then. You know, right? Sounds like you, you get things going, have a good first year, you got momentum going. Um, um, but a few years into your career, 
right? That's, we all know what happened then. I guess not a few years, but you know, um, and the reason I like to talk about, you know, that, that the real estate market crash is, um, I mean, it's inevitable that they happen, right? And people forget what that was like, you know? So how did you, as you were building up and building this momentum, when that market transitioned, you know, how did you adapt um, so you could continue growing your business in those times? So uh, great question. So yeah, we started, so I started selling in January of 03. My brother and I formed the Weidler Brothers team in January 1st of 2004. So basically a year, it took us a year to figure out how we were going to work together. We probably, I think we had a 10 page agreement between us. So uh, um, we did not take it lightly. Um, and uh, we, we were growing our team at growing at a nice steady clip, um, certainly taking advantage of the hot market in which we started. And when that, when the market took a nosedive, um, it, it put some financial pressures on our business model because we had, we had a payroll and, you know, uh, one thing every business owner knows is, you know, the, the revenue is not certain, but the expenses are. And so um, we made a, a strategic decision where everyone else seemed to be pulling back on their marketing spend. We, uh, we kept the pedal to the metal and we picked up a lot of market share um, uh, in, the, in those times. Our, our volume went down, I think it was, I think it was 08, was the only year since we've been doing this business, I think it was 07 to 08, was the only year we were doing this business that our, that our team volume went down, um, but it went down like at a much lower percentage rate than the overall market. So we did, even in that year, we picked up market share. Um, it was a risky decision, but we really felt like, you know, um, our, our value proposition, the, our approach to this business was different enough from the other agents that it was a real opportunity to, to get our, our differentiators out there and our value proposition out there. Yep. Now, now during that time, you know, cause he got, um, you know, actually our mutual friend that, that introduced us, you know, I know, um, you know, he and I, when we first met, um, Leo, who you know out in that area very well, um, you know, we both got very heavily involved in REO and, and, you know, some of the short sale processes and, you know, that did you, did you guys transition into that? And cause I would get imagine with your, with your law degree, that would help you immensely, especially with that short sale negotiation and people having that confidence in your ability to help them through that process. You know, we, we sort of stayed to our core, which is, you know, we, we view ourselves as a luxury uh, um, full service brokerage and we didn't want to um, do anything to sort of dilute our, the value that we were bringing. So we really, the, re, the attraction to this business to my brother and me was um, the business had really changed with the internet and became much more of a consultative uh, business and that was our background. So we really, um, you know, we work with what um, we work at all price points. But you know, we work with prof professionals who care about their money, who want to be talked to intelligently. And so we really stuck to that core, um, that core market. And of course, we had some buyers um, and unfortunately some sellers. You know, buyers taking advantage of sort of short sales and sellers, unfortunately, who were in the short sale position, we gave them good advice, but we weren't trying to go after the sort of that REO market um, specifically and, you know, work directly with the banks. We felt like that would dilute our, our value. Yep. Yep. Love it. So then now I know today, I mean, fast forward, you've got, uh, um, you know, you, you, you guys have your own, not just a team, but now you started your own company, your own brokerage. Um, how, how did that come about? You know, cause I know a lot of team leaders that are at that point where it's like, you, you get to that size and, and you know, it, it, again, it's a tough decision. I'm sure it was a tough decision for you guys because things are probably going really well of, Hey, do we keep this machine going with this team or do we, you know, branch off and do our own thing? How, how did that decision come about? Sure. So, um, so we were a team until uh, about two years ago, and we went. We became independent and left our uh, the mothership, and, and now we're Wider Brothers Real Estate in the D.C. area. Um, so, a couple of things. One is our team was always structured differently than what I think the majority of other teams in the country are how they're structured. And what I mean by that is uh, most teams are structured such that the team leaders generate the leads and they have some sort of organization under them to service the leads. Um, that was not our structure. Our structure was we built a platform that agents can plug into 
to generate their own leads, but to do so more efficiently and then have this incredible support on listing coordination, marketing, contract processing, a runner, so that the agent can, could narrow their focus from all the things that an agent has to do typically when they're on their own to what I, what I consider the, the key agent high, high value add pieces of the business. So that was a, that's a, this is a different model for most teams. And then um, uh, going back to 2015, it was my brother Hans was, he was on that Amtrak train that got uh, derailed in Philadelphia. I don't know if you remember, it was, it was going over 100 miles an hour and flew off the tracks. And it was a really scary time for our family. Um, he he uh, came out of it okay. Um, but we, we, it was a time where we decided like what, you know, you know, introspectively, what do we want to do with our lives? We felt like we had built something that was so unique and did not exist at the brokerage level. And that um, every other brokerage in town uh, had sort of more of a more traditional model. So we decided to take our team structure and blow it out as a brokerage. So we really think we're building uh, what we like to call the next generation brokerage, which is, um, you know, let, if you think about it, you know, these organizations that these teams are building are micro businesses and they're hiring listing coordinators and contract processors. And, you know, sometimes it's just a licensed assistant and every little team is sort of reinventing the wheel. But we think actually this through the scale of the brokerage, you can actually do that at a much higher level. And, and so for instance, you know, our, our, we call our um, people specialists, we pay our specialists, um, they have 401k, they have health care, they have profit sharing. Because of that, we're able to hire and retain and train much higher quality people. And those people are there to support our agents. Um, rather, you know, when we were a team, frankly, as much as we wanted to, we couldn't afford to provide health care. But now that we're a brokerage and have, some, you have higher, bigger scale, we're able to do things that you can't do at um, the team level. And then we think that, frankly, the managing of those people is something that, you know, I, uh, that is better done at the brokerage level because I think a lot of agents, you know, they, they, don't, they don't appreciate not only are they paying the people, but they're taking time to manage them. And so, we're, again, we're trying to take all these distractions and noise away from the agents so they can be highly productive. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree. I mean, all these teams, especially as big as these teams are getting and yeah, I mean, you, you become a brokerage inside a brokerage, you know, I mean, other than maybe you're leveraging out the bricks and mortar, you know, um, you know, but uh, it, it just makes sense. And it's, yeah, it becomes that kind of catch 22 where a lot of agents don't want to pay a big commission split to a brokerage, you know, and then brokers want to give what agents, what they want, not really necessarily what they need, but what they want. Um, and then now you've got all these brokerages where it just becomes a place to hang your license, cut your commission check. There's no other support outside of that, you know, right. And I think that's why the team concepts have gotten so popular. It's like teams today are what brokers or brokers used to do 30, 40 years ago or whatever that provided that support. And, and I, I think there is a huge demand for that. So when you talk about, you know, kind of those key money making activities. So if a new agent's listening to this, because I don't think a lot of agents know what those are and what to really focus on and how to manage their schedules and, you know, what their highest dollar producing activities are with your structure, like what are those activities? Like what do you take off the agent's plate? And then what are those activities that you have the agents focusing on? Sure. So uh, I want my agents to focus on three things, lead generation. So getting the lead, lead conversion, so taking that lead and converting that person into a client, and then client servicing. So that's getting, getting uh, the client, a buyer, uh, to find a home and ratify a contract, or a seller to get a, the listing um, under contract. Uh, the other things that the brokerage takes care of are um, uh, a marketing platform that agents just plug into. So every agent comes on to Weidler Brothers. We do a big marketing launch around them. Uh, all of our agents, uh, and this is another thing that's unique to us, are on the same CRM platform. So uh, we, 
you know, that the leverage of that, the power of that is incredible. Um, you know, and the reason agents are willing to do it with, with us is because they trust us. And, you know, we, we're not asking them to put their information to, into our CRM because we want to do something with their relationships. Those are their relationships, but we're trying to give them a structure to be more efficient with their relationships. So all of our agents, um, they get their people get a newsletter for, uh, or two emails from them every month. One is a beautifully written and designed newsletter. The second one is a, an update of all of our activity. Um, and that comes out, that's, you know, the agents don't have to do anything. That just comes out from them. Uh, uh, and it's also having a CRM is incredibly powerful. If you think about it on a listing appointment, you get to tell your seller, look, you're not only a, you know, your listing is not only going to be uh, accessed by the, you know, the, the 500 people I know, it's going to go to the 35,000 people that all of the agents in our database, you know, have relationships with. So that's a really powerful uh, um, networking um, talking point. Um, so all the marketing is, the, the marketing infrastructure is there for agents to plug into. Um, if one of our agents wants to host, you know, sponsor a neighborhood event, for example, rather than saying, oh gosh, I'm going to sponsor a neighborhood event, what should I do? They work with our marketing department and say, okay, I want to do this neighborhood event. Our marketing department says, okay, we had three of our agents sponsor one last year. This is the things they do. Do any of these things work for you? And, you, and so again, we're trying to leverage the collective intelligence um, other things we do for our agents are listing coordination. So the, the, our agents, um, I don't want my agents writing brochures. I don't want my agents, uh, um, putting stuff into the MLS. Our listing department does everything soup to nuts from meeting the photographer, writing the brochure, putting it in MLS, interacting with the client along the way. Of course, the agent is supervising and involved. But the, 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 the key labor is taking off the agent's shoulders. And then contract processing. Once the property is under contract, all the shutting the documents back and forth to the appropriate people, making sure that people are getting, the agent's getting notifications when appraisals are running, um, about to expire, or uh, contingencies are about to expire. That's all run through our contract processing. So, yeah. you know, a lot of brokers just say they do some or all of this stuff, but I can tell you, like, these are systems I built out for my personal business over the years, and now we obviously built it out for the brokers. So these are the quality of what we do and how we do it is unparalleled because it's got to work be, you know, it's got to work for me and my clients, my brother, his clients. It's got to work for all of our agents at a very high level. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, too, if, if you know, agents – truly knew the time involvement in those, right? Um, you know, it's not just the, of, of having to, the money to hire that assistant, but if they truly knew, and I know every state's different, but like here in Arizona where I have my team, you know, cause we, we, we track this stuff very co closely, but our average listing input, that's five hours of time between ordering up the photos and the signposts, the lockbox, everything turned in to the brokerage, MLS input, all of that. And the contract to close is 10 hours, you know, right? So if you have an agent close of four deals a month, plus listing, you know, two new listings, you know, right? You're talking 50 hours a month of just data entry stuff that they could be, like you said, lead generating and, 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 you know, lead conversion, those high level activities. So just removing that time becomes huge. And it sounds to me like what you guys have done a brilliant job as, is almost becoming like this hybrid, you know, right? You're not your traditional brokerage, not a traditional team. You just kind of took the best of both worlds, combine those. So those agents can't be laser focused. Um, I'll tell you, so you, you, you hit the nail on the head, which is, um, you know, we're having a lot of agents reach out to us and think about joining us. And we're, we're, we're being, we're being very selective with who we, we pick in terms of, we just want people who are the right culture fit and have our collaborative mentality. We like to say that, uh, you know, we, we want the agent who has enough confidence in their abilities that they're willing to share their best secrets, their best tricks, their be best marketing strategies with everyone in the brokerage. And if everyone's doing that, it's a very, powerful and a dynamic place to work. Um, but as soon as you insert one person into that mix who is not willing to share and then who's a taker, it, it, that kills the culture. So we're trying to be very close, uh, careful. Um, but going back to what you said, um, we were having these conversations and, and uh, a lot of agents, um, you know, you know, it's almost like, it's so funny. It's like, we, as agents, we talk to sellers all the time and the sellers like, well, you'll, you know, you'll do it for, 
you know, 6%, but I just talked to another agent, we'll do, do it for 5%. And then what do, what do you do as an agent? Well, you start selling value, right? So um, I was having those conversations with agents, but they were still having trouble under quantifying it. So we actually built a, a model that, that does what you did, which actually builds in the time that they put into these various activities and the, and the expenses uh, that they put, you know, the out of pocket expenses for ordering the brochures and the photography and, and, and paying for a runner or, and, and this model is so beautifully takes their current situation and aligns it with our situation. And, and 90% of the time, not the money is better with us. And what it, what's really sort of jaw dropping to the agents we're talking to is on average, uh, or I should say the range is agents are saving anywhere from two weeks to three months out of the year in time, time that they're currently spending on, I don't want to say it's unimportant activities, but they're activities that they don't need to be doing. And if they, if, and once you quantify that component, they're like, Oh my gosh, you know, now, you know, if I have an extra four weeks in the year, could you sell another house? Could you sell another five houses, 10 houses? You know, the answer is you, you better <laughs> yep. uh, or at least take a much longer vacation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep, love it. And then, you know, you, you see some of these brokers that have so many different models and they try to be all things to all people. Um, you know, do you, do you have, I mean, is it just like, hey, like here, here's who we are. This is what we're about. This is our structure. This isn't a fit for you. Okay, there's other that go to ABC down the street. Or do you have kind of variable structures for maybe somebody that doesn't want that support? Or maybe I have my own team. I already have my own listing coordinators and transaction coordinators on my own team, you know, but I still want to be associated with your company. That's a great question. And, uh, the answer is no. We, we want everyone. It's very important for just to maintain the culture. We have a collaborative environment. Um, you know, you can't see our offices here, but we have no, there are no private offices. Uh, our that. office was designed by the same architect that did the Google offices in DC. And it looks more like a tech office than it does a uh, traditional real estate office. We do not want silos. We do not want little groups running around. We want everyone to work off the same um, a collaborative environment. Uh, and, you know, I, I, you know, we're, you know, one thing we're very sensitive to, and uh, not all brokerages, I think, appreciate this, is our collaboration is always to help each other, but that collaboration stops when, um, uh, when it, it would in any way impact our clients. So, for instance, we believe very strongly when, when one of our agents has a new listing, that information is extremely powerful. And I think what a lot of brokerages do is they actually um, set it up so their their broker gets first bite of the apple. Like we're going to privately market that listing internally and see if we can sell it internally. And if we can, our, our brokerage benefits. But in my opinion, that hurts the seller. So what we're 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 we are um, maniacal about is. When I, an agent has that information, they do not share that with our brokers prematurely. They do that. We find out in the, you know, along with everyone else in a big way, but we're not stacking the deck so that we're going to make more money at the expense of our clients. So that's where, sort of from an ethical standpoint, we draw the line. Yep. So do you, do you think that your time at AOL, right? Because like you said, when you start with AOL, like they were, they were leading the, the, you know, they were ahead of the curve, right? And now if you see somebody that has an AOL email address, you're like, what is wrong with this person? I see it all. You know, right. You, you had the, you had the juggernaut that, that just died off. And, you know, do you think your experience with being there and seeing that transition from, you know, them again, being this giant to, to now almost being non-existent um, has kind of helped you, whether it's conscious or subconscious, have that same view of real estate brokerages. And that's why you're working so hard to, to stay ahead of the curve and make the anticipate these changes, you know, before agency even maybe think that they, you know, because like what you've got, you don't, again, you've got a lot of teams, but you, what you, this hybrid that you have, you just don't see in the brokerage world. Yeah, no, absolutely. My AOL experience was phenomenal. I went from being in a, in a big uh, DC law firm where I had uh, I had so many safety nets under me. So, for instance, as a lawyer um, in a big firm, as a junior lawyer in a big firm, I could never throw I could never send a document to a client without having a partner review it. 
Um, when I got to AOL, uh, you know, my first deal, you know, you're the lawyer. There's no, there's no partner behind you. So uh, you were, you know, I was 100% responsible for the all the the the, um, the contract. And what's what's because when you're in house. Uh, you actually live with that contract. So when you when that contract's signed and it goes into the drawer, uh, you know six months later or maybe six weeks later, one of the operation operational people calls you and says, "Steve, we want to do X Y Z. Are we allowed to under the contract?" And then I'm like, "Oh crap! I never thought of that." And you had to live and I had to interpret my own contract that I wrote. And and in in, in one case, we actually had to litigate the contract that I wrote. And I'll tell you as a uh, that experience of writing a contract and living with the consequences of the contract is the best training for a lawyer. And it was incredible training for me to get into real estate because that's what, frankly, what agents do. We're facilitating a transaction. We're writing the, we're writing the home inspection addendum and then we got to live with it at walkthrough when we realize we wrote it funny and the seller interpreted it differently. Yep. Yep. Love it. So, you know, you, I'm sorry, would you, were you going to add something? So the other thing that gave me, so I really, uh, you know, I, I, I was, um, uh, in the in the middle of an extremely exciting, growing company, and when I left, it was just starting to, uh, you know, turn. Um, you know, the AOL story that so many opportunities that we're not taking advantage of, and it really gave me sort of a, uh, a much keener business uh, perspective of you know trying to take you know take opportunities, and uh, you know, you know, at the end of the day, I think AOL's biggest failure is they forgot the consumer. They're, they became about making money and they forgot, they, you know, if you think about Google, uh, is, I think is a great, you know, they, Google built great products first and figured out the money second. AOL got to a point where they were trying to make money first and they completely uh, forgot about the consumer. If you think about the old pop-up ads, that's sort of like the best example. Like they didn't care about the consumer experience. They just want every pop-up ad was, you know, another, another dollar in the, in the, uh, in the register. Yeah. And then, you know, in, in this interview, you, you, you've mentioned the word numerous times now, but culture and, and, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if a lot of, whether it's real estate agents, entrepreneurs, realtor, broker owners understand the power of culture and what it really means and the energy and the difference. Cause it's like, look, I could have the same exact model you have here in Arizona um, uh, to a T but we get two different results and a lot of that plays down to the culture, right? Um, what are some of the things that you guys feel that you do to create such a strong culture? I know you talked about the office setup and different things, but kind of walk us through what you do there to, to keep that amazing culture and keep that energy alive and, you know, have a company where people are just excited to be a part of. Uh, it's a great question. So, um, and again, our marketing is sort of uh, reflects sort of who we are in that sense. So we, if you look at it, all of our marketing, um, uh, there's always a sense uh, uh, there's there's a sense of humor in it. We always try to you know have um, uh, you know a little bit of edge, a little bit of whimsy in there. Um, for the, when my brother and I first started the team, uh, we thought we thought long and hard about the team name and. Uh, we decided to go with Weidler Brothers because while there are a lot of husband-wife teams and, and mom-daughter teams, there frankly weren't a lot of brother teams, so we thought that would differentiate us. And we realized uh, very quickly that we could have a lot of fun with the sibling rivalry. So a lot of our marketing had that sibling rival rivalry uh, theme to it. And then as we as we mature to uh, become a brokerage, and actually you know one or two years before that, we, we got to a big – big enough that we wanted to leave the brother branding behind and we we talk more about the family um and so we really do treat you know our you know it's a cliche but we treat our our agents and our specialists like like a family so we take a lot of time uh recruiting people and really making sure that they share our vision um uh we we really try to uh, always err on the side of generosity in every case. Um, and when uh, we, we ask our agents when they are doing internal referrals, you know, the standard is we want whatever you agree to, it should be something that you would have felt happy with if you were on the other side of the deal. And that's been a really, um, we have had minimal, if any, flare-ups between agents in that regard because we really we really try to keep that culture of don't operate from a sense of fear, operate from a sense of abundance. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and we do we do a lot of uh, parties every two years. We do a big trip, uh, pretty extravagant. Last uh, last year we went to Cancun, stayed at the Ritz Carlton. Fifty people there had a blast. Did a lot of uh, great team bonding, or I should say broker bonding, and did a lot of great strategy sessions. Um, we also do something that I think is really um, uh, amazing, and I credit my brother with this, is we really try to provide the business scaffolding for our agents. So I think a lot of agents and other brokerages, even, even um, uh, ones that have, you know, claim to have all this training and business, they, they're, the agents are pretty much operating in silos. They don't really have a lot of context to their business. So every year we're doing it, we're in the middle of it right now, is in, in, the, in September, we give our agents a, a budget template, which is a Google Sheets template, um, and we ask them to fill out their budget for the following year. Um, we do a pre we do a pre meeting, and what we do is we line up, we create groups of eight to ten agents, um, and we put them in production categories. So we have uh, up you know up to ten million, ten to twenty, twenty to thirty, thirty plus million categories, and then we line up their budgets in a spreadsheet. Uh, line by line and we sit in a room and we go through line by line why are you you know you're doing 30 million in production uh, but you're spending 10k on direct mail and 1k on Facebook but uh, why are you spending you know 30k on Facebook where how how are you spending 30k and you're just having very intelligent conversations by people now they're now speaking the same language because they're using the same uh, um, uh, uh, um, the same uh, budget template so that they, they can sort of, not, not that one is right and one is wrong, but you can just listen to how someone at the same production level is spending their marketing dollars. Because I think in this business, people say, oh, I spend 10% on marketing, 15% on marketing. But the problem is there's no consistent language because one group might consider marketing. They have a marketing person. Uh, one of their employees is marketing person. So they're putting that expense into that marketing category. The other team or agent might not, but by doing it this way, it, it's a very, it's so amazing how agents use these conversations to adjust their, their budgeting for their following year. It's just, again, it's just much more substantive context and, and help and structure for these agents than they could otherwise get. Yeah, yeah, love it. So, I mean, it sounds to me like like the, the key to your guys' culture has really been, I'm sure, that, like you said, you do a lot of fun events and um, a lot of great training and all of that, but it seemed like at a core level, it was getting clarity on what you guys stand for as a company um, and then recruiting people, spending a lot of time recruiting, making sure that you have people that align with those core values that you've created. And, and would you say, it, it, you know, would you say that that sounds correct, that that's really the key to it? Absolutely. I and mean, frankly, we tell everyone before they, you know, anyone we're thinking about recruiting, we let them know, look, you're, you're going to be sharing your, you're going to put your CRM, you know, your database into our CRM. You're going to be sharing your budgets with your colleagues. We're going to ask you to share all your best tricks, secrets, tactics for, you know, generating leads, closing deals, uh, what have you. And, you know, the agents who operate from a sense of fear, it filters them out. We, we you know, uh, you know, it's a great saying. The opposite, the off, the opposite of abundance is not scarcity; it's fear. Yeah. And so, the agents who have enough confidence in their own abilities that they're willing to share, that's that's an agent that thrives in our environment. And the more, um, the more of those people we get, the the more powerful it can be. Yep. Yep. Love it. Um, then, you know, I, I know that you guys have been at this now as far as on the brokerage model for, for a couple of years. I mean, what is for you and your brother? I mean, what's, what's your ultimate vision for this? I mean, do you guys see you, you expanding this onto like a national level or, or, you know, how big do you guys want to go with this? Uh, yeah, I think our, um, uh, I would say for the next five years, our goal is to become the dominant broker in DC, the DC area. So Northern Virginia, DC, and, and close in suburbs of Maryland. Um, beyond five years, I think this model does, uh, um, has legs to go national. Um, I think you said earlier, you know, I, the, the business, um, consumers are getting better and better tools. And I think what's happening is, to consumers are getting better tools to to figure out which agents are the ones that have the best track record, the most success, who'd sell the most in the neighborhood. Right now, a lot of that information is out there, but it's a little bit fragmented. So you go, you know, let's talk about Zillow. 
different. You know, I could go into a neighborhood or an area that I've never sold before and buy a zip code and all of a sudden me and my, you know, whatever 30, 40 great Zillow reviews will start appearing in a neighborhood. The, the consumer doesn't really know, that doesn't tell the consumer how many homes I've sold in that neighborhood. But as these, as, as these consumer tools improve, eventually, you know, it's going to be very easy, easy for a consumer to say, I want an agent who uh, has great reviews, who sold in my neighborhood, has a good negotiation track record, either you know on the listing side or on the buy side, and um, uh, you know, might know a few people that I'm linked in with, right? And so as as those as those consumer tools become uh, uh, more powerful and more transparent, we think what's going to happen is there's going to be what we call a flight to the elite. So it's going to, you know, instead of it being an 80-20 rule, it's going to become a 90-10 rule. And so, you know, we want, we're trying to build this brokerage so that we, our, our agents are in that, in that 10%. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. And, with, and we, the cool thing is, yeah, I mean, you have some sites of like Zillow that, that can be very deceitful, but you know, what I love about all this technology and all this, this just, you know, expansive growth with it is, you know, agents can, you can, if you do it right, you can create that own perception on your own and go out there and combat with, with technology that exists. And as you see this, you know, cause I, I get asked this question a lot. And recently I was just asked to be on a, a panel out here in Arizona that featured some of the top agents in the area. And it was the whole, it was, it was um, like real estate agent survival, whatever panel. And it was about how us as agents combat technology um, and not combat it, but use it. So we don't become replaced by it. And like, what are some of the things that you think real estate agents need to be doing for the future, um, you know, to use, to leverage technology, but make sure that it doesn't replace us to the consumer. So, um, you know, we actually did a, um, a really fun uh, sort of uh, mind game at our last all hands meeting where we asked people to sort of think about the future of um, driverless cars and like once cars go completely automated, how does that, how will that affect the world? All the different things like insurance and do houses need garages and how will cities be planned and all the different industries, taxis, Uber, how those things would be disrupted. So we just, you know, it was sort of an exercise to free up people's create, creative thinking. And then we said, okay, let's talk about how, what is the, how will technology affect real estate? And you, know, you have, you know, artificial intelligence. So um, better and better uh, um, way, you know, you might say I want a house with a um, renovated uh, you know, renovated house, um, you know, there's going to become, uh, you know, search engines that will, will actually look at pictures and be able to tell if a house is renovated or not. So that can replace a lot of the sort of the manual labor that agents do to sort out the different listings because it's some things are hard to search in listings. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, and, and maybe self-servingly, but I do think, Consumers buy houses infrequently enough and that it's a big enough decision that at the end of the day, before someone actually makes that decision, they're going to want to look a professional in the eye and say, hey, am I making a dumb decision here? Yeah. So I, I think for the foreseeable future, the, we're not going to be disintermediated like, like you know travel agents have been or uh, stockbrokers have been. But I do think... Um, you know, agents have to keep moving along with technology, keep being cutting edge. Um, you know, I think Remind uh, that uh, Ariana Bray has uh, that you spoke with a few weeks ago. Um, their business is really at the forefront of what's happening in uh, uh, data intelligence and pulling in different sources of data to give uh, to give agents more uh, transparency and visibility as to um, you know who might be the best. Uh, um, person to move in the next few few weeks or months. Yep, yep, love it. Couldn't agree more. Um, with, with, with whether it's your own personal business, because I know that you're, I, I believe that you're still actively selling as well, right? I am still selling. Yes. Okay, yep. So then with, between that and then maybe, you know, the, the systems that you have in the team, I mean, what are, for 2017 as we're winding up this, like what, what have been, I don't know, like your top couple favorite systems that you guys have inside your business that you feel are just very effective, very efficient and allow you guys to take it to the next level? So great question. So, um, uh, our, one of our favorites is Slack. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, really? We use Slack uh, very uh, effectively in our business. So we build out, build out all the channels. Um, you know, basically Slack takes a lot of the communication that would otherwise be on email and puts it into the right, the right categories. Um, so what it does is, you know, you set up your categories and the idea is any communication that has a shelf life to it, you put in Slack. For instance, you know, hey Josh, do you know a good electrician? Or hey Josh, do you know a good realtor in Detroit? Those questions might, you know, they're not only relevant today, but that someone might want to ask that same question uh, three months from now, three years from now. And so if I, I have an if we do that in email, only the people on that particular thread see the answer to that question. But if you do it in Slack, in you know the the contractor channel or in the referral you know uh, channel, that information is now archived there. So the next agent who needs that information, they don't have to send an email. They can say, "Oh, someone already found an agent, Detroit." And so it just it it's been a very uh, effective tool, and we we do it. We have an ask the broker. We we actually have some title attorneys involved. So we have um, it's become a really uh, valuable tool for us. Yeah. So you're not just using it for your internal staff. I mean, you're using that organization wide. You know, right? Every agent, every specialist is on Slack. Yep. That's awesome. Love it, man. Love it. Okay, the office is you know. Um, uh, you know, you know, putting out, you know, we use it for, you know, the brokers open. So our, our agents, uh, our, our specialists will consolidate all the different broker open in the week and send it out to all of our agents. So the agents don't have to spend their time sort of pulling all the different pieces together and, and, and sorting that out. Yep. Yep. Awesome. So then for you personally, right? Because, all right, so you're, you're, you're the principal broker, you, you own this company, you guys are expanding, you're growing, or you're co-owning the company with your brother. Um, you've got your brokerage duties, you're recruiting, you're training, um, you know, you're out there still actively selling, you know, plus you have a family, plus you're taking care of your health. And, you, you know, as you have all these hats that you're wearing and all these responsibilities, you know, like, how do you personally manage your schedule and your time to ensure that you're not dropping the ball, like let's just say with your health or, or with your, your family or whatever. I mean, what does that look like? Do you have a daily routine that you follow or, or how do you ensure again that you're staying on top of all of it? Well, you know, I, I really, uh, I'm a big believer in balance. And so uh, we really try to, uh, you know, put family first. Um, I, I'm, you, know, you mentioned earlier, I play, I do play a lot of squash, which is a ruthlessly efficient way to get exercise. Um, and then uh, you're right. I have a lot of demands on my time. I frankly have really good people. So um, uh, my, I have a director of operations who helps me uh, with my, my personal sales business. Um, she is uh, phenomenal and uh takes an incredible amount of uh, weight off my shoulders. I'm still involved in every transaction, but at a, at a much more strategic level than I used to be. Um, and then, uh, you know, you, you, I really try to budget, budget my time. Um, we, we have, uh, um, you know, I think you, you know, you keyed in at, you know, at, the, at our size right now, we're about 65 people total. You know, we're right in what we call no man's land where, you know, a brokerage is too big for me not to continue selling, but it, and it's too small for me. Um, uh, I'm sorry. It's not, yeah, it's, it's not big enough for me to continue selling, but um, you know, uh, you know, it's, demanding a lot of my time, but we're, we're, the growth is, is phenomenal. We're going to grow about 33% this year from last year. Um, and we're talking, agents are coming out of the woodwork to talk to us because no one else in town has our model. Yep. Yep. Love it, man. Love it. So, um, I have to, I do have to bully through this next few years. You know, we're a startup, you know, in, in a lot of ways. So I got, I got to get through them. Yep. Yep. And I love that. So then, um, you know, some, some broker, realtors that, that, you know, are thinking about becoming a broker, whether it's a team leader, whatever the size is, you know, I, I talk to a lot that have this concern of being a competing broker inside their own brokerage and how that will be perceived. And, you know, I mean, my, my 
thought process on that. And I've always had competing brokers that, that I've worked for at their brokers. I love it, you know, right? Because I'm like, you know, if, okay, if I go join the brokerage down the street, we're still competing brokers, you know, right? Um, but I love the fact that, you know, I love having a broker that uh, is, is active in the game, that, that ha- is, is playing in their own sandbox, creating success in its own market. Because for me, it's just that much more power um, when I need their support and assistance, right? Um, compared to somebody that maybe hasn't has sold a home in 30 years. Um, you know, what, what are your overall thoughts on that? Because again, I, I think that that becomes that scarcity, or you said that fear mindset that a lot of people have when starting their own brokerage um, of being a computer, a competing broker and how that perception is going to be internally. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think it comes down to reputation and, and trust. And so um, I can tell you that my, uh, you know, we, uh, when we left Long Foster a um, uh, couple years ago, we, at the time, we were one of the top three teams in the company and they had, I think, 12, 13,000 agents. Um, and we were, you know, the, you know, everyone likes to quote the Wall Street Journal, uh, real trends as, but we were, we were 25 in the country. Um, so we were big and, you know, my managing broker, although, um, you know, I, I liked her very much, or I should say all my managing brokers, they never had a team as big as I had. And so they could not add value to me in terms of helping me scale my business and, and because they hadn't dealt with the issues that I was dealing with. Um, and so one of the things that I can do for my agents is regardless of where they are in their, their, their size and, and maturity of their business, I can add value to them because I've been there. And the other thing I can do is you know, I've sold a, a ton of homes. I've sat in more kitchen tables uh, uh, in people's homes and dealt with really difficult deals and uh, all sorts of personalities. You know, I used to draft highly complex legal documents. I can add value to, to my agents in just about any situation. And then I, I can also sit with them, and I do this all the time. I go with them on listing appointments at, um, uh, to help them close the deal. So, you know, I, because I, uh, you know, we have sort of that, like you said, a hybrid like model. Um, it's, uh, it's very powerful for me to sit with them. It's like you have the, you have the owner of the company sitting with you who is still in the game and can talk really intelligently about, you know, our value proposition and how, uh, you know, we built our marketing engine so that we can have an agent who's never sold a house before, you know, go through our training, come go to their first listing appointment ever and be able to say with confidence, you should hire me because we have the best marketing plan in the business. No one does what we do how we do it and no one can execute to the level we execute and no one else can say that because we do that agent isn't necessarily doing the execution of the marketing plan they're they're doing these those other things i talked about earlier yeah yeah love it love it so if the steve today knowing everything that you know now through this whole entire journey um if the steve today could go back to let's say your 18 year old self you know when you were making that decision to go to college and have a conversation um with yourself and give yourself a few pieces of advice that you just feel would have fast tracked your success not that you know i get that everything happens for a reason and we don't have regrets or and, and whatever but if you could hypothetically go back and just give yourself a few pieces of a powerful advice that would have fast tracked the success, what would those piece of advice look like? Oh gosh. Well, I probably would have bought uh, some Microsoft and Google along the way <laughs> um, uh, and Bitcoin apparently. But um, uh, uh, I would say um, uh, uh, one, one is buy real estate early. Um, I waited way too long to buy real estate. Even, even when I became an agent, like I said earlier, I'm, I see the glass half empty. I, I passed in a lot of okay opportunities because they weren't perfect um, that I really, in hindsight, should have uh, um, started, started building up an investment portfolio of real estate uh, earlier in life. Um, and then do a much, much better job of keeping in touch with people uh, and, and, and um you know, not just friending them on LinkedIn, but really truly keeping touch with the connection with people, finding out more about like, not just the resume, oh, where do you go to school? Where do you work? But just getting to know people. Um, Cause you know, we, we um, you know, my wife and I joke like in DC, like people ask, oh, how was your weekend? And people say, oh, it was busy, busy, busy. Uh, like, I, I don't, we don't like that answer. Like, it's like, no, tell me like, how was your weekend? Right. Yeah. Cause it's not, it's not a badge of honor to say you're busy. Like, you know, um, 
we really want to get to know people and what, you know, what, what they're about. And, you know, those relationships are, you know, that they add meaning to life and they're frankly powerful from a business perspective, whether you're selling real estate or, um, you know, you know, selling, uh, anything. Yeah. Yeah, couldn't agree more, man. I mean, because at the end of the day, it's, it's like we're not in the real estate business. We're in the human connection, human resource business, you know, right? We just, just help them facilitate that experience. And yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, uh, Steve, what is, you know, because again, we have, uh, you know, over 100,000 uh, 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 listeners every single month on this podcast and, and the vast majority are real estate agents. And if somebody's listening to this, that's maybe in your area and they want to have a conversation with you, learn more about you, learn more about your company, uh, maybe want to join your company, what was the best place to go out there and get more information and do that at? Well, our, our website has uh, a ton of information about, uh, you know, what we're about, our videos uh, sort of show, you know, tell tell our story. We've also, my brother and I, have been pretty uh, prodigious prodigious writers. We've written a book called Inside the Cell, which, frankly, uh, really gets into his, um, sort of our philosophy about the business and how it should be should be run. I touched on some of the things that earlier on the uh, talking about the private exclusive and the stacking the deck um, for sharing information in, inside brokerages. Um, uh, we've written a bunch of articles uh, uh, from the, for the Washington Post, um, which are also on our website. And uh, um, you know, we have—I think we have a really good reputation in town. Like we were—I think we're straight. People know us as straight shooters, and we try to make transactions, you know, as with as little drama as possible and as, as smooth as possible. Yep. And those that are watching and listening, we'll, we'll make sure we have a link right below with that website so you can click on it and make it easy. But Steve, those, because we get a lot of people that are on iTunes or Google Play that are driving down the, the road and may not be able to click on the link. What is uh, that website name? Oh, sure. It's WeidlerBrothers.com. So it's uh, our, our, uh, spelled W, Y is in yellow, D is in David, L-E-R, Brothers spelled out, dot com. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, just last question for you. I know we're going long on time here and I know you're a busy man. Um, those that are watching and listening are here because they want to go out there and create their own amazing epic life, just like you've been able to do. Um, do you have any last pieces of advice or inspiration that you'd like to leave them with so they can do exactly that? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, great question. I would say, um, you yeah. know, Hmm. That's a big one. I, w- I would say just, you know, attack it. You know, like I said earlier, like failure is not an option. Make sure, you know, if you go in with that mindset and really have a plan and execute your plan and avoid the flashy uh, objects, um, you know, especially realtors especially have so many distractions, so many people waving a little flashy thing in your face saying, oh, do this and this will get you an extra deal and it'll pay for itself. That, that is um, a recipe for disaster. I think it's really important just to have a vision, a path to get to that vision and execute that path. doesn't mean you shouldn't look up every, every so often, make sure you're, going, you know, you're heading in the right direction, but don't, it, that, 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 um, uh, not, certainly not every day or every week. And then lastly, you know, don't, don't let uh, being busy fool you into thinking you're being productive. Uh, there's a huge difference between the two and you got to figure out what's, what's putting money in your pocket and what's, you know, um, what's not. Yeah. Love it. Powerful words. And those that are watching, listen, I know in every podcast with this, you guys, but information without implementation truly is the start of delusion. Information isn't power any longer. It's taking that information and taking massive action on it. That creates that power in your life for you to go out there and create the life that you know you want and deserve. And Steve shared so many amazing pieces of advice with you guys. They take something that you learn immediately go out there and start executing on it. So again, you can create that life you know you want and deserve. And Steve, I know how busy you are, you man. Uh, truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to be here. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Josh. You made it easy. I appreciate it. Yeah, you got it, my friend. All right. Thanks, you guys for watching and listening. We will see you next time.